uh, you know me a little bit. I, I like to be light hearted in, in the way I, I approach work. You know, we have to be serious about our job, but not too serious. Yeah. Because otherwise you lose you lose perspective, especially in sport mm-hmm. and in in academia. Because hey, we work in sport, which is what everyone else loves. We are lucky to work in and around sport. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Working in Sport podcast. My name is James Grigson, and today we're joined by a very special guest. He is the Associate Professor at Victoria University. He's worked in various roles across academia all across the world. Uh, He's currently beaming in from Portugal, from the World Congress of Soccer and Science, Fabio Serviello. Fabio, thank you for joining. Uh, My pleasure, James. Thanks for having me. Good, mate. So, have you? You just mentioned uh, off air that you're in Portugal at the moment. What What's your role there at the conference? So, so you're chairing a few things. Uh, what's brought you to Portugal? Yeah. So, apart from being jet lagged, uh, I uh, I am part of the scientific committee of the this World Congress of Science and Soccer, which is part of the the World Congress of Science and Football family. Uh, we hosted the last one in Melbourne in 2019. That was pre-COVID. And um, this conference is, is, is the little sister of uh, World Congress of Science and Football. So it's, it's obviously focused on soccer. And yeah, we're in Portugal. So uh, great, great town, Coimbra, about two, two hours north of Lisbon. And so today I just chaired one of the sessions, which is part of our duties. And um, yeah, there, there's a good vibe. And I'm sure glorious weather as well. It's, uh, I'm in the UK at the moment. It's heating up for UK standards. There's going to be a heat wave. It's going to get close to 30 degrees in the UK over the weekend. So that's that's very hot. Uh, I'm sure you're enjoying some lovely weather in Portugal yourself. Yeah, we are. We are. So I wanted to chat to you today about your journey. I, uh, I feel like, and this is to do with people's roles, but there is almost like a bit of a divide in uh, the practical, uh, the practitioners in our industry and then the academics in our industry. I, having, in my opinion, in dealings with you, I would consider yourself a very practically minded academic. Um, obviously, you know, your work throughout Victoria University um, in the academic world has, is, is well noted and sitting as an associate pre- professor at the moment. But, you know, you've also had links in with the, the Melbourne Victory Academy during your time there, had a performance across the, uh, the women's program and the academy program. You also had a fair bit to do with, in the relationship between Vic Uni and Melbourne Victory as well. Can you talk to me about the state of the, the practitioners versus academics somewhat divide that happens in our industry? Like I mentioned before, it's certainly something that is a byproduct of your role, but it, how important do you deem the ability to be able to you know, be an academic, but also have a practitioner's mindset or to be a practitioner and also maybe have an academic's mindset and trying to blend those two personality types and how important it is for people in our industry? Yeah, look, you'll be surprised. That, that was one of the topics of uh, this morning's conversations after oh, really? the, the opening keynote. We were in the in the uh, lounge of the conference center with some with some friends that uh, you know we we catch up every time this conference is you know is happening, and we, we were saying exactly that, that that it is difficult and for you know as long as I've been in academia, you hear this academia versus practitioners debate. And every time at a, at a conference, there is the commitment to bridge the gap, which in reality, it doesn't sound like it's getting any, you know, any smaller. There, there are good examples in the industry of, of where it happens quite well, but the majority of, uh, of colleagues still report quite a hard time as academics in sport or, or as practitioners in academia. Mm. And I think, the the main issue that everyone is reporting on is that clubs don't have someone whose sole role is to work in the education space and to manage the relationship with with universities Mm -hmm. because obviously it's not a priority and that's fair enough and universities not every university has a practical heart you know, I think we do. We we do a, a 
the CUNY, we, we're very happy that most of the people who work in, in our college of sport and exercise have been or are in sport as well or, or around sport, but uh, it's, it's difficult. And I, I've, I've experienced the, the challenge. I'm, you know, full disclosure, I'm not one of the most experienced academics in terms of the time spent in, in clubs. There's, there are people here who have done it for many, many years. Uh, but yeah, I, I experienced that challenge my, myself of how do you try implement the good things about academia? There, there are not that many, but, but there are some good, good things uh, into club land um, yeah. and, and vice versa. It's not, it, it's not easy. And you, you'd said that, I guess, one of the primary things that you'd mentioned is uh, the, the lack of maybe the permanency of a role to sit inside of a, a club to make that link with universities um, and, and industry alike. There are some clubs that do it quite well, you know, where, well, where you're from and where I used to be from uh, down in Australia. But in your view, you know, what I see more common is like, yeah, they have a relationship and the PhD student will come in seasonally, you know, but, and they'll almost just get given a task that at some, at some clubs I've seen, it's just sort of a, it doesn't seem like there's maybe much thought put into what this task is going to be um, and the importance of the task. And maybe when you say having someone in a, at a permanency level in a club to sort of have the relationship with the, with the university, are you talking about a consistent person full-time that is then sort of managing any sort of PhD projects that come in? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And it's, it's a bit, it's a bit of a utopia. It doesn't happen in, in, uh, many sports or many countries. There are some good examples uh, of of clubs and universities that have done have done it really well. And and we had some good examples with VU and the Western Bulldogs yeah. uh, of you know a, a good setup. Uh, but I think it's it's hard. It, it's not fair from u- universities to expect that education and the relationship with you know, students, interns, PhD uh, research pr- projects is or has to be a, a priority in in a, in a in a sporting club is not it's not fair you know people that work in sport don't think about education and students and and research project every day because they get dragged into the day-to-day issues and and look that that's their their job but when you find a, a good relationship with the club and there's understanding about where the benefits are uh, that's great, and I think you need to, you know, in those situations, you need to try have someone who, whose sole job or, or main job is to be that point of contact and that conduit between the student on, on placement, the interns, the PhD students, the research project, they, you know, uh, nurturing the ideas that come from the university, but also from the club, from the coaches and the management, and they can, you know, they, they very much can, uh, is just not easy to get the commitment financially to, to have a position that sounds a little bit abstract you know, yeah. from a club perspective. Because like you said, it's, 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 more, it's most beneficial when there is that true collaboration and it's like the club has a need, the university has people and resources and, and they're willing to assist there and they're willing to get in on the education and learn from that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't, like you sort of alluded to, that doesn't necessarily align with seasonal budgets. Like the, the, the fun problems that come up that are actually exciting aren't seasonal and aren't, they're not annual. So when you, I, I guess, yeah, some of the issues are because there are annual relationships, or annual contracts between clubs and, and universities. And it's almost like, okay, well, well we need outcomes. So we're just going to have to do these projects and uh, that becomes a part of the challenge. So certainly That's an right. interesting one. I wanted to talk about your your work with um, some of the other sort of governing bodies, like you mentioned your involvement with a, a conference that you have here, and you spent some time as a as a chair um, with with the, the the Exercise and Sports Science Australia group. Right. From from a professional point of view, and and as a professional, why why in your opinion is that important to sit on those boards and have those relationships? Yeah, it. It was it was very good. I was I was uh, involved for three years as as the chair of the 
of the advisory group as I, I think ESA realized that they, they needed more um, direct uh, input from the sports science community being, being an, an organization that traditionally was created because of um, uh, accredited exercise physiology and exercise science. So that was the, the main focus, not so much the, the applied sports sciences. And so when they, they, they realized that they, uh, they, they wanted some more direct input and, and maybe representation across the sports science landscape in, in the country, it was a good opportunity. I put my hand up and I ended up chairing the, the group for, for almost the entirety of the, of the three years. And, and it was important for me because uh, there are a lot of discussions, even you know, some heated discussions about where, where sports science should be heading in Australia and, and, and what is ESSA's role and what shouldn't be ESSA's roles and what is the club's role or what the university's role. And I just thought the only way to find out and the only way to actually contribute is to put your hand up and say, okay, I'm willing to help. Um, and so that, that was important because it, it gave me a learning experience. It was also important because I was missing that experience in my, in my CV. You know, there's no point in line about that. Sometimes you need to look at what are the skills that, that, you, that you're missing to progress to, to the next step. And I was missing, uh, you know, a, a, a role with an external body. I, I had experience in, in sitting and contributing in committees and uh, Dick Uni's academic board, which is, which is very interesting, but I wanted something in connection with, with the industry. So I, I did that and, and uh, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad I did it. The, the skill sets learned on sitting on boards like this, I myself haven't had um, the, the, the experience doing so, and I'm sure a few people that are listening um, may not as well. What do you think the, the skill sets there are? Is it, um, is it the access? Like, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is the network that you have there is, it would be tremendous, especially an organization like ESSA. Um, I, I feel like your network would really open up, you'd strengthen relationships there with key professionals across the network. Um, but outside of that, do you, what are some of the sort of the key skills that you thought uh, you were able to gain either from, you know, sitting on boards like that with, with ESSA or even some of the other work? Uh, yeah, look, ESSA is particular because it's a governing body and it's, you know, it's providing the independent, um, I guess, accreditation of, of uh, an area of, of uh, education. And I think in particular for the advisory uh, role of, the, of this advisory board, uh, yes, you need the networks, although we, we didn't, it, it wasn't a public um, engagement that we did as an advisory board. Um, we, we tried to, to be more direct and you know, discuss our, our ideas and suggest outcomes. Uh, I think that the, the most important skill was uh, being able to be honest and, and straight to the point uh, because I think organizations need feedback that is you know, biased or unbiased. Uh, we, we try to, to give unbiased feedback without uh, getting a judgment uh, biased by the fact that we also work in a stakeholder. You know, that, that's important because my, my main role is in a university and I was on an advisory board to an organization that directly influences what universities do in courses. And so there's a sort of, it's not a conflict of interest at, at all. It, it is a you know, is managing the, the expectation that you're there as an individual, you're not representing yes. the, the, the university. Uh, but that was by far, I, I think that was, uh, how, that, that's how I tried to, to interpret the role. And may, maybe you should ask the other members of, uh, of the advisory board wh whether I did that or not. But yeah. I always try to, to be honest and say, look, I think this is right. I don't think this is right. I think it's not the way we... We should go. At the end of the day, it was just an advisory board. When it wasn't binding, we we honestly suggested what we thought was important for the industry. The uh, in February 2019, you you came out um, and and produced a website amongst the industry called Compare Sports Tech. I wanted to understand, in your own words, uh, what you wanted to do with that. Because personally, um, I think there's you know certainly a need for it. Obviously, with the plethora of sports technology that is coming out. 
Um, I think people in industry need somewhere to go. They need someone to speak to. Um, and and not more than just sort of listing out the sports tech, th this website, comparesportstech.com, is a place where people can go and really dive into the products a little bit more, get your sort of, um, you know, ratings on it and your contributors' ratings on it. What was the, the impetus for that? Um, I, I missed 10 seconds of, of what you were saying, but I think I got... I got the the overall idea. Uh, look, it's it's a fun project. I can't I can't actually start from any other point. It is it is a fun project. It's something that I, I wanted to do for 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 a while. It's a bit of fun. Um, I but but I'm actually quite surprised everywhere you know I go and and I speak to different people. They they say, oh, we just love the resource that you put together. We we just hope that it would you know we hope it can grow. And at the moment, it's just it's it's, it's my project. There's there's not there's no structure behind it. But um, it, it was it originated from a couple of discussions that I had with uh, sub elite coaches in 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 soccer in, in Australia uh, at, at the NPL level, which is you know the the, yep. the second division. And it was a few years ago, and and both people said to me, "Oh, we need to we want to invest in a, in a GPS." A system what should we buy and i think it's a classic you know uh, questions that many oh, people yeah. who work in academia get and i i said oh look i i have experience with this and i've got experience with that that's it uh, i personally think that you need abc but it was my opinion and then going back home i started to think maybe there is a an idea maybe maybe there's a way to do it um, in a little bit more structured way and with, with those websites where you compare, you know, insurance and all those things, uh, which is something often. And I, and I thought, well, if you can compare very complicated things like insurance and home loans, why can't you compare technology, which essentially is, is you know, it's, it's simpler. And, and so I, I started to contact companies um, and you know fusion sport was one of the the early ones and i tried to come up with a, a method a simple method to to say okay we need some information about hardware if there is hardware or software and some usability things and and there is a big part missing that people keep asking which is about the research component of you know what has research said about products it's a bit easier in some categories, harder in 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 um, in other. You know, you you cannot assess the validity of a of a athlete management system. There's no such such thing. But there are other aspects that, that that can be added. And so I just said, okay, let's do it. And 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 I I started and grew in the last the last three years to to many categories and um, and it's it's free. It, I always, it's a bit of a joke. It's, you know, for the good of the sports science and humanity. Uh, but it, see, see where, it, where it takes it. Well, it, it sounds like that's true. Like given, uh, like it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, you know, obviously you joke about the sports science humanity, but it, if it's coming from a place of fun and enjoyment, then it probably is for the good. And if, and if you're, you know, you've done it basically, essentially to scale your own mind so you don't uh, you don't have to have these <laughs> these constant conversations I, I dare say it is good and it is good for the industry I myself do use it as well uh, you know people people ask me for sort of it's comparisons great. and I go well don't trust don't trust me for a comparison let's say on an athlete management system or a timing gate I'm going to have some bias go check out go check out this website um, do you I know you said you sort of did it for a bit of fun and obviously there seemed to be a need based off of the conversations that you were having, but is that just your own entrepreneurial spirit, I guess, that, that got you to, to do something like that? Or um, is there something, you know, cause I look at your, your sort of your, your CV or your career so far through academia. And then more recently, obviously these, these sort of uh, advisory board type roles have started to come up, obviously compare sports tech has started to come up, but I'm just interested in your mindset around sort of diversifying your own self as a professional um, and whether this has just sort of come naturally or you thought, hey, this is important that I start to sort of have different elements to, to, to who I am as a professional or, sorry to keep rambling, is it more just a byproduct of, um, 
you know, it, you, you've had a, a good, strong career, close to 10 years um, or, or a little bit over 10 years in, in Australia with, uh, with Vic Uni, it was time to sort of maybe just add some diversification for your own life. I think it's a little bit of all of those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and I don't, I'm not one that is particularly good at, at, at um, you know, shining the light on, on, on myself and, and, and what I do. But um, I always remember when I, when I did my, my PhD, my principal supervisor once said to me, you're a very entrepreneurial PhD student. And I didn't quite understand if it was good or bad. Uh, back then, uh, I, you know, I always make fun of that moment, but I think it was good. It was it was meant as a as a compliment, because uh, yeah, from, from the very beginning in in my academic uh, journey, I tried to diversify a little bit um, what I did because it's very easy in in academia to get. Um, I think you know, yeah to protect your own space and say okay, I'm I'm teaching, I'm doing research. I have a bit of engagement with the, in, the, the industry, you know, a club or, or a governing body, and that's it. And that's all you do. And I think this that's one of the reasons why the industry sometimes have, have problems with dealing with academics, yeah. because yeah. it just stops a little bit short of what, what they need. And, and, and so I started to say, okay, let's explore a little bit. Let's find uh, solutions to to issues rather than presenting you know new issues to the people that I was working with and for and and I, and I think yeah that, that was good that was an interesting uh, process that I keep I keep um, uh, applying uh, and so it's the same thing you know being part of an advisory committee or or, or in in the in the specific case of Compare Sports Tech yes it was a little bit of uh, entrepreneurial fire in the belly um even if you know i'm not selling anything uh but uh, it was the idea of okay for once i have an idea i spoke to some people that i had a good relationship with they validated the idea that it, that it was you know in, in, the, in their mind it was good it was worth pursuing and then there was the that point in which you ask yourself oh god am i actually going to do it and put it out there because you have that that idea that okay maybe there's no need for it maybe people think they're going to be you know it's going to be a silly idea or maybe you know all of those things that are, I'm, I'm sure we all we all um uh, we all fight against all, all those discussions that we have with, our, with ourselves but it is very rewarding to then say okay i had an idea and i did it and it's out there and yes it's a entrepreneurial project in the you know in inverted commas, because it's not, I guess, you know, it's, a, it's not a for profit. Uh, not, 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 not that entrepreneurship needs, needs to be for, for profit in, in all cases. Um, but that was very good. And so the process of actually contacting the CEOs of the companies or the, the sales managers of the companies, getting the information, get the, getting their feedback, and then actually build the website from scratch. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was fun and it was, it was important. Uh, I learned a lot. As we begin to to wrap up here, I want to understand, in your own words, if you were a if you were a young budding, budding academic again, what would your advice be to yourself? I do, I actually think I would I would do all of those things again, um, because I, you know, I came to Australia because I wanted some opportunities that I didn't think I I could get in in Italy or Spain, which would other two the, the two countries where I started and lived b- beforehand and so I my point was always to make a move to be successful whatever that means to people um, and whatever that means to me I'm, I'm you know I've got my own, my own opinion and so to do that I had to push my, myself and get involved in different things and 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 create a network and and try to achieve things in my, my own way, uh, which is with ambition, because you need to be ambitious. Uh, sorry, not, not everyone need, needs to be ambitious, but I, I needed to be ambitious because that was my, um, 
yeah, it was part of my character and it still so is. You are. Yeah. But also doing it in a in a fair way, uh, having some fun. Uh, you know me a little bit. I, I like to be light-hearted in in the way I, I approach work. You know, we have to be serious about our job, but not too serious. Yeah. Because otherwise, you lose you lose perspective, especially in sport mm-hmm. and in in academia. Because hey, we work in sport, which is what everyone else loves. We are lucky to work in and around sport, and also we work in academia, which is great because you can do research which is which is you know engaging and interesting and you teach people which is fantastic we always forget about how much of an influence we can be on on the student and how we can you know share uh knowledge both ways it is a good environment so that was important for me so the suggestion sorry i went a bit there it was good keep going that way. yeah uh, but the the advice that i would give maybe to myself and to others uh, who, who ask me often is just push, you know, push yourself. Don't, don't be scared of, 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 you know, asking questions and, and proposing new projects, new collaboration. I, I see it a lot in academia with, with younger uh, academics who are scared of maybe making the first move and say, Hey, should we, do, we should do this. Uh, they they're scared of the re- the rejection from you know, their supervisors or the the head of school whatever yeah. and I don't think I've ever had that problem in my life the the you know the fear of receiving a no never existed and so that's that's you know my my go to skill uh, in 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 life and in work. I'll give you a bonus question because that was a very good an- answer. I'm interested in your perspective on we spoke about. And a little bit full circle here, we spoke about pr- practitioners versus academics. I asked you through a lens of an academic and what, what your advice would be to a young academic. W- what about for a young practitioner who might have come out as a, let's say, sports science and then might have gone and got their master's at, uh, at ECU? What would, yeah. what, would be, what would be your advice for a young practitioner? I don't know if I can comment on getting, getting their master's at, at ACU. Yeah. Uh, look, I, it's it's interesting because obviously I haven't lived that experience of being a practitioner first and going the other way. Although I work with many, yes, uh, who, who make that's why I'm interested in your perspective on this. Yeah, I, I and it's fantastic because they they have an appreciation of academia that we don't have. Um, and so th- there's two components. One is, I would say to the practitioners to, to ask questions because from those questions, they, they, there's a lot to be learned in academia. You know, the, the questions that the coaches and the SNC coaches and 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 you know sports scientists have in practice on the on the field or on the court or, or you know in, in practice, sometimes they are overlooked by ac- academics. And actually, those are the, 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 the important questions. So I, w- I would say to young practitioners, make sure that you communicate those doubts or questions that you have in practice. Uh, be patient with academics because we're, we're a bit of a different breed. And sometimes, um, sometimes the time that takes to get to decisions or to elaborate on, on you know, things and get into outcomes it's a little bit longer than what the practitioners are, are you, you used to. You know, if they work in a club, they used to ask a question and get a yes or no. If, you, if it's yes, we do it. If it's no, okay, whatever, I'll think about it next time. While in, in universities, typically, we have long processes and, and um, uh, multiple iterations of, of thinking about things, which is great because that's, you know, universities where always traditionally the place where these you know where philosophical discussions yeah. happened about things and it's important that it doesn't get lost otherwise we become you know just another business or organization uh, but it, it's important to have patience and understanding there is value in those communications and there are some frustrations so uh, yeah push and learn i think Fabio, I'll, I'll let you get back to the Congress, but I must say, this is why I wanted to speak to you. The breadth and depth across 
many different elements of the industry is the reason why I wanted to to pick your brain and have a chat. I hope. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope people watching oh, have enjoyed you. it as much as I have uh, speaking with you, mate. Ladies and gents, thank you for watching. If you want to subscribe to the channel, you can click down here. If you want to watch our last interview, you can click up here. I'm Fabio. I'm James. Enjoy the rest of your day.